Welcome to IDS Talks uh, podcast. It's great to have everyone with us today. I'm especially excited because uh, we are joined by an esteemed friend here in the UK, Laura Ford. Laura is a partner with DLA Piper here in the UK. She advises and represents clients in the uh, large scale uh, in, in serious sort of fraud endeavors, uh, not just in the UK, but in a multi, multi jurisdictional uh, capacity as well. Laura, welcome to the show. Thanks, thanks for coming on. Thanks, Tim. Great to be here. Well, Laura, let's. Uh, if I could, uh, just really briefly, I, I, I did introduce. Uh, I did introduce sort of how you uh, fit into DLA. But if maybe if you wanted to give uh, a, 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 about a minute or so on your, your sort of specialism there at the firm and and, and how you assist your clients, that, I think that would be useful. Sure. Uh, well, you hit the nail on the head, really, Tim, in your intro. So I'm a partner in the corporate crime investigations and compliance team at DLA Piper. So I have a particular focus on fraud, bribery, money laundering that inevitably goes with those things, modern slavery, amongst a plethora of other areas, effectively any area of misconduct or criminality that a company can get involved in, our team will support on. Um, that's both from a compliance perspective and an investigations perspective. Um, so helping clients design and implement their uh, global, national, international compliance programs, supporting them on internal investigations where issues are identified internally, and also with external investigations if regulatory or law enforcement authorities come knocking at the door. Uh, mm. So that's, that's us in a nutshell. Right. Well, and you do so with great repute, I might add. So uh, glad glad to have you on board. Can, can I sort of jump into a, to a couple of questions? Um, we, we are talking, we are going to sort of talk about the the rise in furlough fraud uh, inquiries, the the kind of system that's in place to, to maybe start addressing that here in the United Kingdom. Uh, but really sort of, I wanted to kick off with um, kind of as someone who works in investigations and in supporting clients and responding to those, uh, what sort of examples have you seen where where technology has been uh, either crucial or or quite important in aiding in that investigative effort? Do, do you have some examples for us? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I would say it's imperative in any investigation. I've been uh, doing corporate crime investigations for the last 13 years or so and whilst the tech has changed over time and getting exponentially better it's always been absolutely key. Uh, perhaps a little less so in those early days where we were trawling through swathes of bankers boxes in mm. and vaults um, but moving forward you know, swiftly into the focus on electronic data. Um, the hundreds of millions of emails and instant messages and other forms of communication that are used in clients' businesses, you know, the, whatever the given time period, time period might be. It's that tech that is reducing those terabytes of data down to manageable levels and making it mm -hmm. um, manageable to review, analyze, and provide a service to the client. So whether that's through the technology-assisted review on document reviews, machine learning, moving more so into the AI now and proactively issue spotting. Uh, the tech is imperative. Yeah, makes sense, and it's something uh, you know. Selfishly, it's something that uh, you know with which we're quite familiar, and, and our practice is is solely not solely, but but critically focused on the application of technology to solve more or less data driven problems. And investigations is a large part of what we do as well. But I I sort of encase it in a more broad description in that we're really just trying to solve data-driven disputes uh, more broadly, let's say. Um, I, I'm not the right person to describe this uh, completely, but I think for our for our viewers, I'll just give a 20-second overview of what, what we mean when we say furlough fraud, and then yeah. I'll ask some follow-up questions about that. Uh, so f for those listening and, and watching today, the the furlough fraud concept here in the United Kingdom is basically um, basically surrounds whether corporations in the United Kingdom availed themselves of a job support scheme, which we call JSS here for short. Uh, the government loves acronyms, but the the a lot of these um, these claims for for financial support were either done erroneously uh, in the spring. Everyone was told to go home pretty much post haste. 
Uh, and there wasn't a lot of consideration about if they were filing paperwork correctly. Everyone was just trying to protect the NHS, you know, follow the government guidance, that, that sort of thing. Fast forward to now-ish and in some months prior to now, uh, it's been discovered that the job support scheme perhaps was abused or misused by, by companies around the UK and not just here in the United Kingdom, but elsewhere in, in Germany and other parts of Europe, they're, they're seeing uh, fraudulent claims as well or potentially fraudulent claims. Uh, Laura, the, the, the BBC and others have covered this pretty closely, uh, particularly with the, the budget uh, meeting that happened yesterday here in the UK. Uh, what, what are your sort of thoughts on the, the estimates around the, the fraud abuse? Is it as prolific as the, as the press kind of indicate? Uh, do you think it's better? Do you think it's worse? What are your What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, I think only time will tell. Uh, the best we've got at the moment is HMRC's own assessment. It's kind of working assumption of how much uh, of the uh, furlough payments are likely to have been related, or well, to be wrongly claimed is the phrase they use. I think to cover both mistaken, erroneous claims, but also fraudulent claims. Mm -hmm. So uh, stats at the end of January, there were £46 billion pounds worth of claims under the job retention scheme. And in September 2020, when Jim Harra, the chief exec of HMRC, was called along to the uh, Public Accounts Committee, he stated that HMRC's working assumption was that 5 to 10% of that would have been wrongly claimed. So we're looking at 2 to £4 billion pounds just over the course of the prior year where the scheme had been in place. Remembering that the job retention scheme is just a small element of the government support package. So when you look at the overarching figures, it's about 133 billion when you add in the bounce back lo loan schemes, uh, the business interruption loans, self-employed income support scheme. Um, and if you assume that there's an element of fraud in relation to those as well, there's a vast sum of money out there that has been claimed that shouldn't have been, whether it's you know, where it is within the five to ten percent, or if it's outside of those ranges, I think only time will tell. Mm. Yeah, thanks for that, Laura. And 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 whilst the the exchequer might think that it prints money, uh, we do have to we do have to pay for this in some some shape or form. Of course, there could be there could be certain levels of write offs in here in, in the UK and other and other European countries as well. But largely, I think the approach is for for corporation tax revenues to rise at some point in the future. Not the, dis not the topic of discussion here necessarily, but the recuperation aspect in general is something I wanna sort of touch upon. How, how, how are HMRC and, and the authorities kind of uh, fixed or, or sort of preparing to, to tackle these uh, potentially enormous groupings of uh, fraudulent endeavors? Do you have any insight on that? Sure, so it's been, an issue, you know, a, a, a vocal issue for HMRC ever since the schemes came into place. Um, and again, in the uh, committee appearance last year, last year we heard from HMRC that they'd already had 8,000 whistleblowing reports in relation mm -hmm. to furlough fraud that had given them 27,000 um, what they described as high risk cases of serious error. Mm -hmm. uh, the types of error that we're talking about might range from simple mistaken overclaims. You know, if it's a, a, a new scheme put into place with urgency and haste, uh, undoubtedly errors will have been made in claims. And that's one aspect. But then kind of moving along the egregiousness scale, mm. there have been businesses requiring employees to work whilst they're on furlough, for example all the way through to claims for non-existent employees or employees who have resigned or who moved on to other roles. So there's a whole range of types of issue that HMRC um, will be looking for. And they've got this vast array of uh, information that's going to allow them to pursue those things. Um, we've already seen some arrests and we're looking at very serious um, offences here. So right. the arrest that we've seen so far, they're focused on fraud by false representation, fraud by abuse of position, the inevitable money laundering charge that comes with actions like this. So we can see that HMRC is very actively pursuing um, these claims. 
absolutely against fraudulent claims, but also saying it's not going to actively pursue those genuine, honest mistakes, but it does expect businesses to assess what they've claimed and to rectify any overclaims. Um, and of course, you know, the government has a significant task ahead to balance the books arising from the pandemic. Mm. And HMRC has an opportunity to contribute that and will be under pressure to do that. Mm. The same way that we saw them uh, call before the Public Accounts Committee last year. Undoubtedly, they'll be asked to account for this. Um, and you know, we, we do expect this to ramp up, you know, especially with the scheme coming to an end in September this year now. Um, you know, there'll be plenty of HMRC officers with uh, time that they didn't previously have, and they'll be looking to move back to their traditional area of pursuing mm -hmm. this tax or these false claims or overclaimed amounts. And and they're they're a little more uh, sort of empowered to do so quite recently, aren't they, Laura? There, there's there's a uh, there's a report coming into the Guardian and others over the last day or so that there's roughly a hundred million pound all allocated to a task force uh, to, for, for HMRC to investigate uh, these sort yeah. of more serious offenses. Uh, have you have you uh, been in, have you been sort of indoctrinated into that at all? And do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, I think that we will only see more of that. It's quite right that they be empowered to pursue fraudulently claimed amounts. Um, and, you know, as I say, there's a big task ahead for the government and where there are such significant potential sums that have been overclaimed, um, that will see significant action from HMRC in seeking to recoup it. Mm. Um, and they'll be using all the tools at their disposal ranging from, uh, so they've started publishing the names of all those businesses that have claimed furlough amounts, mm. um, 750,000 at the last uh, count I saw, and actually that's increasing all the time, um, through to naming and shaming deliberate defaulters, mm -hmm. trying to use that uh, public censure to uh, deter and prevent against fraudulent claims through to the use of their criminal powers to pursue this kind of activity. Well, that's that's a good question, and I um I, I do want to follow up on it. Actually, I won't. I promise not to steer off too far off course. I, I try not to, but um, the the HMRC are going to take this seriously, of course. But obviously, we have to balance the books here, like a lot of countries have to have to do. Uh, and and you know, going after the sort of low hanging fruit, if you like, would would be sort of serious fraud abusers and, and offenders uh, and uh, in addition to tax evasion and the other channels of recuperation they might have. Do any of these, in from your experience, do, do, do any of these carry sort of, um, these offenses carry custodial sentences? This is more of a question for me. I don't know if anyone else is wondering it, but I've never really considered this. Uh, is, is it purely a, a name and shame and kind of fine arrangement or, or does some of these have more serious repercussions? Uh, no, absolutely, they do. Um, so the fraud money laundering offences, we're looking at 10 or 14 years as the maximum term of imprisonment. Of course, that's for the most egregious offending, and there can be a whole range along that way. Also, unlimited fines for companies. Uh, so this isn't, you know, simple... You know, no victim type crimes. Mm. There really, there really are victims, and there really are significant penalties. Um, certainly for individuals involved, personally, and also the scope for corporate criminal liability, where mm. individuals who are sufficiently senior within a business to be the controlling mind and will commit an offence, uh, that itself can bring liability for the company. So it's and very important to know what's there um, and to manage it. And, and does a lot of that rest on the shoulders of this, this sort of senior management regime generally, or or are other uh, directors in the business and other p individuals sort of going to be the target of that as well? Uh, it will be a question of fact and degree in, in each case, assessing who's involved. Uh, we're talking here about the deliberate, dishonest um, overclaims or furlough fraud. Mm -hmm. um, identifying who exactly is involved, who knew about it, 
we're going to talk in a moment about the structured data that can help us identify these kinds of issues. But the unstructured data will, will remain relevant there, looking at the emails, communications and messages to identify who's involved um, and who knew what at what stage. Um, but equally, if there are lapses in controls and processes, there might be um, difficulties ascribing to the company in that way as well. So there are a whole range of areas of where, where a business can potentially fall down in relation to these issues. Yeah, thank you for that, Laura. Um, let, let's move into that, that bit on structured data you just alluded to. Uh, it, this is obviously, all of this interests me, as you might have noticed, but the, the, the elements about the data are of particular uh, curiosity to, to me and, and others at the firm. And my producers would be, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't start talking about some of this with you. But uh, the, the concept of structured data, let me, I'll actually unpack it in about 30 seconds. So we're all on the same sheet of music, perhaps. But structured data is a term familiar to some. Maybe, maybe we could call it something else. I, I tend to call it more behavioral data, whereas unstructured data are your communications, your human authored content, your emails, your your chat messages, your uh, your your prose, the things that you say to other people intentionally. Structured data are the billions of data records and little points all over these different computing systems. Think of it as almost like data stored in a spreadsheet kind of rows and columns. And a lot of these data are ignored in investigations and, and certainly in, in disputes, arbitration, litigation, that sort of thing. They're, they're often seen as not low hanging fruit, maybe unduly burdensome. But the manner in which we can now kind of normalize and extract and look at that information in a meaningful way has kind of broken down some of those barriers. Do you think looking at that kind of data in the context of these claims uh, is useful. I'll, I'll just start. I'll just start with that as a kind of open question, Laura. Yeah, I think it's inevitable that companies and government agencies will start looking at this kind of data. When you think about the types of roles that have been required to be furloughed over the course of the pandemic, those people who have desk-based jobs might be um, more able or might have been more able to immediately move to a home working environment and continue doing what they were doing from home. Of course, that's not the case across the board, um, but certainly for uh, very many workers. Um, and perhaps less so for those who are non-desk based, who perhaps have more engagement with other people, the more need for close contact, say individuals working in warehouses or factories or shops or whatever it might be. Um, and so trying to establish if they were working or not during any given time is more difficult. You don't have the evidence that you would have if they were sitting at their computer working. So you need to look at these other aspects. I think that's exactly where the structured data can come into help. Great. Yeah, it's encouraging to hear that. I mean, it's, it's difficult to sometimes... I don't want to say open a can of worms, but sometimes it's a little difficult to uh, overshare information with with regulators. I, I, clients can be corporates, especially, can be reticent to over provide, uh, depending on depending on the situation. But in the context of the or in the seriousness of these allegations, particularly particularly if they suspect some significant wrongdoing, in the face of what you just said, are potentially unlimited fines. For instance, uh, it might it might behoove them to to sort of have a closer look at not just who approved what and, and texted and emailed about what, but uh, you know this this concept of proving a negative. Did people actually not work when we said they would not work? And that's that's a question that I'll I'll ask as well. We we find this to be very difficult in, in investigations. I don't come at this from a from a legal practitioner's perspective, but I've worked in electronic investigations at all different levels and and. Uh, mm -hmm years for, for many years and proving a negative is always very difficult. Uh, how do you, I mean, how do you think that, that some of the structured data can kind of help tell that story, the, the, the behavioral data, how do you think it can kind of uh, make, make a bit of a visual story for, for investigators to understand if people were indeed working? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I think in these types of cases, it might be the only way of identifying whether a person was working or not. Mm. So, so when we start an investigation, there might be whistleblower allegations, there might be some evidence to start off with. There can be a whole range of starting points. And what we'll try to do is um, a hypothesis. If this were true, if furlough fraud had been engaged in, what would we expect to see? And we can absolutely apply that from a structured data perspective. So if a person was working in, uh, say, collecting items from a warehouse and delivering them somewhere else, what structured data points would we expect to see in relation to that? Mm. You might have their swipe cards as they arrive at the warehouse. There might be tracking data in relation to the items they were delivering. There might be um, tracking data in relation to their vehicle. Perhaps it's fitted with a um, speed speedometer, a speed recorder. Mm. Data from there might be useful. Uh, delivery data would be useful. So all these types of things uh, that you would expect the business to have in structured format would tell you about the story of that person's day. Mm. If they hadn't been working, none of that would be there, and that would help you to prove the negative. Yeah, that's a really interesting bit of insight, and it, it meshes really nicely with what we call a day in the life, sort of when our teams are looking at what, what people have been doing. Normally, we sort of look at that in the context of wage and hour sort of class action back in America, where that's quite a significant issue. It's where people paid the the time over 40 hours or, or what, whatever it is that, that they're owed. And, and doing so is, in, is done in kind of looking at emails, are they clocked into their uh, records management systems, so forth. If you, if you flip that on its head, what we want to see here is effectively a flat line. If someone was sent home in April or maybe mid-April, they had to go in and get some of their effects from the office or what have you. It was a bumpy start. But if they're availing themselves of the job support scheme, reasonably, those people should have data points that are flattened out. Uh, unless it's some automated thing that you can explain away, people shouldn't be logged into their tills, their uh, sales entry systems. They shouldn't be interacting and creating these these data points, unless it's I, I, I will add probably some explainable automated thing. Uh, not all not all indications of data points are are going to be nefarious necessarily, but but looking at that, I think is is going to be key. Uh, on that, uh, and I kind of kind of alluded to this earlier. We all know that you know corporations have different risk appetites. They have different uh, kind of tendencies for for looking into to issues uh, that may be on the horizon. But as an approach, do you think corporates will sort of adopt this? D do you think this is something they'll kind of give way and, and allow a bit of? Because previously, a, a lot of what we see anyway, and probably a lot of what you see as well, is all right, give me three years of email for your sales team or your marketing team. Let's see if there's any market abuse and kind of really looking at it in a narrow tunnel, if you like. Do you think clients will start adopting this uh, approach now that it's becoming a little more flexible and well understood? Yeah, I think so. And I think it's up to the advisors such as ourselves to help clients along that journey. And when you think about whether clients would be willing to undertake audits like this using this kind of structured data. Um, there will be a range of approaches. There'll be those clients who are confident of their position, don't consider it necessary at all, perhaps uh, you know, focused on rebuilding post-pandemic rather than looking back in relation to those aspects. Um, others who might have concerns that perhaps despite central edicts that pockets of the business might have been overclaiming in some way, whether that's through genuine mistake or purposeful misconduct. Mm -hmm. They won't be able to appreciate that until they've conducted the review, perhaps. Mm -hmm. There'll be those who want to be good corporate citizens. You can even see circumstances where this kind of analysis could be embedded in the business to make sure on an ongoing basis that claims um, have been acceptable. We've got another six months to go of the of the uh, furlough scheme in the UK at least, um, and so on the look forward, there is still a, a huge need to make sure that claims are being made correctly, and then all the way through to the other end of the spectrum, where you might have whistleblowers uh, within a business 
is perhaps an employee who uh, finds out that furlough payments have been claimed in relation to them, even though they've been working, for example. Um, others who might find out that a manager has been purposefully overclaiming and blows the whistle. Mm. In the best case scenario, that happens internally, so the company has an opportunity to investigate, engage uh, expertise in relation to investigations and data analysis and find out what's happened before taking a proactive approach, self-reporting to HMRC and seeking to achieve mitigation in that way, as opposed to whistleblowing direct to HMRC and the company being faced with the full force of a HMRC investigation. Uh, but in either of those circumstances, if the business has the opportunity to investigate in advance or if it's doing so reactively it's got to be done quickly and efficiently they need to identify the issues remove the bad actors if there are any and have the ability to rectify the position with hmrc that needs to be done quickly and, and cost effectively and a really good way of doing that i'm sure will be through the use of this kind of structured data analysis mm. to get you those answers quickly um, and, and with very positive useful evidence of exactly what happened in the day in the life mm. i like the way you describe that you know of the employee to see if they were there or not and if a claim should have been made in relation to them before i let you go laura something that's uh, something that just popped up into my mind i mean we've kind of discussed this early amnesty period that hmrc had yes. did you file erroneously come forward we won't bang you on the head you know th there won't be a lashing from from the authority mm -hmm. That said, you, you've mentioned kind of uh, internal whistleblowing or discussions and then going to Her Majesty's Revenue and saying, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. you know, take it, take it easy on me. To what extent do you foresee that happening, given that they've got an ax to grind now? Do you, are they still going to consider these as mitigating circumstances? Will they just accept repayment and not find them at all? Is that still an option for, for companies or is that kind of, is that ship sails? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there, there was an amnesty period that ran out on the 20th of October last year. That though was at a time when the furlough scheme was expected to finish sooner. I think it remains to be seen if that will be extended or not. Um, if it's not self-reporting and genuine co cooperation, will almost always result in a lower penalty. Perhaps not no penalty. There has been significant misconduct within the business. Um, penalties will flow, but they will be less significant than they would have been if HMRC had had to find out about it itself, investigate itself, perhaps face a wall of opposition from the company um, and then pursue a prosecution as a result. Uh, there will undoubtedly be opportunities to uh, approach HMRC on a proactive basis, you know, go effectively cap in hand, say exactly what's happened. Um, and save them the cost and time of having to pursue the business in that way. And that will typically uh, result in mitigation of the penalties that would otherwise apply. Mm. Well, sage advice from a, a, a top legal advisor in this space as always. Uh, many thanks for joining us, Laura Ford. Uh, it's, it's time we say farewell. So uh, from IDS, thank you very much to all of our listeners. And again, thank you for uh, DLA and Laura Ford for, for joining us today. Welcome, thank you.